Welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's baseball betting podcast. We are presented by BetMGM. Your host today, Brendan Glasheen, joined by two of our MLB contributors, Sean Zarillo and BJ Cunningham. We have a lot to discuss on this episode. It is Tuesday, March 19th, building towards real opening day. But uh, the real games start on Wednesday and Thursday, the Korea series goes down between the Dodgers and the Padres. They've already played some exhibition games. We're going to get to the Korea series later on in the episode. First, we are going to recap some of the best bets from all of our division preview episodes that we've already released. But it's a nice way to tighten it up and bring it all to you right here and sort of an appetizer to lead into the Korea series best bets episodes. We will go through pitching matchups, all the good stuff, and how you want to bet those couple of games If you're on the East Coast, you're going to get up really early. And the West Coast, you might be getting up early or staying up really late. So we'll get to those. Uh, Best bets episodes for the season coming your way Monday, Tuesday, and Friday mornings during the regular season. More to come on that. When exactly we will start that because the season starts on like a Friday. So we might do a Friday show or a Thursday show. We'll have more on that uh, as opening day nears uh, closer to the end of the month. So we'll get to that. And then once we're in like in a rhythm, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, during the regular season, uh, to uh, listen to Payoff Pitch. So please, wherever you listen to your podcast, find us uh, on the Action Network YouTube page. Rate, review, subscribe, and also subscribe and like the videos on YouTube. We appreciate feedback, ratings, uh, or the reviews can be positive, negative. We love it. So thank you. Okay, so let's recap some of the best bets. Sean Zarello was on our AL East Division Preview Sean, a best bet from the AL East show that you want to give out here? Yeah, the Rays, anyway, you could play them. Primarily, they're over 84 and a half, and to make the playoffs around plus 150, plus 145. As we've seen injuries in the AL East pile up, particularly to the Yankees, their chances of making the playoffs and their win total has only increased. So everybody likes the Rays to go over 84 and a half this season. Okay. Uh, guests on the NL West show, Zarillo, we're going to talk about this team later on in the episode. The Dodgers. You have an angle on the Dodgers you want to give out as one of your best bets in the NL West. Dodgers one under 104 and a half wins. If you can get it, it's a very high number, very high bar to clear. And I believe nine of the last 10 teams with a win total higher than hundred all went under their win total, but highest projection aside for mine, I'm at one Oh two, six highest for mine is 100.7. So everybody likes the Dodgers to go under this year. Just would not take below 104.5. Okay. Very good. Tanner McGrath joined us there as well. Arizona's Corbin Carroll is MVP pick at 20 to one. Want to be sure to shop around there uh, to find the best number on Tanner McGrath's pick. In the Central, one of your more bullish predictions as far as a win total, Zarello, in the Central. Uh, American League or National League? National League. Sorry, thought I said that. National League, uh, NL Central. All good. Uh, Brewers over. Uh, Another projection that everybody likes to go over, everybody between 79 and 83 wins. That total sitting closer to 76 and a half. Definitely recommend the over on the Brewers. Also like them to win the division, would probably skip their odds to make the playoffs, though. Path to making the playoffs, likely winning the Central. Doubt more than one team gets in. BJ Cunningham is here. He's been itching to get involved in this uh, <laughs> rapid-fire uh, circle as it pertains to best bets. And in the Central, you've got a team that you're eyeing, BJ, for a best bet? Yeah, the Cubs, to miss the playoffs at even money. Like Sean just said, you know, there's probably only going to be one team coming out of this division, actually, that's going to make the playoffs. And the Cubs, if you look at the projection market comparatively to where the betting market is at, projection market is closer to 40% to make the playoffs where the betting market has them closer to 50%. So a pretty decent edge on the Cubs here to miss the playoffs even money. All right. Let's make our way to the American League West. The best bet Sean Zarillo's got for us is the team that uh, he's going to have to sweat this one out for most of the year, I think. Hopefully not, but the Oakland A's over 55 and a half wins. You can actually take that a little bit higher. This is the biggest gap between public projections and the bar- betting market of any team out there. The range of projections between 64 and 71 wins for Oakland. So they see Oakland clearing that total by at least six and a half games. I'd probably recommend my projection closer to 60 and a half. So I wouldn't really go above 58 and a half here, but still plenty of room compared to the numbers that are out there. Jim Turvey, who you hear on our basketball coverage quite a bit at Action Network, he joined this particular episode. He gave out Logan Ohapi uh, over 15 and a half home runs. That's his pick from the American League West. On the AL Central season preview, 
Uh, Sean Zarillo, you are on one of another team that it's a division that's wide open, and you're looking at the Tigers. What angle is the, uh, the play on the Tigers? Tigers under 81 and a half wins, even 80 and a half. Nobody expects them to go 500 this season. A lot of people expect them to go 500, potentially even contend for the division. But taking the public projections out there, everybody has them between 75 and 79 and a half wins. So the Tigers not to go 500 this season. There's value on them missing the playoffs as well, but would much rather bet the under on their win total. Good for me down to about 80 and a half. Anthony DeBundo was there with us, and he is on the Twins uh, to win the division around even money. The Minnesota Twins, even money. That was about minus 120 when we did the episode a couple weeks back. Uh, so look around for the best number for the American League Central winner. He's got the Twins. And then finally, in the National League East, Zarillo, uh, where are you looking here? Where, where's your best bet coming from out of here? Yeah, a couple ways to bet this. I like the Braves to win the World Series right now at plus 650 or so, even down to 500. Uh, looking at the combined projections for them, there's projections where they have the Dodgers winning more games with the Braves still winning the World Series at a higher percentage because they consolidate better for the playoffs. So I think the Braves are the best team to bet for the World Series right now. Fair projected odds around the market, around plus 400, plus 350, and they were plus 250 at playoff time last year. On the other end of the spectrum, the Washington Nationals, maybe my favorite win total under bet for this season. Plenty of room on this one. I like this down to about 68 and a, or uh, about 64 and a half for me, but the composite projection likes this even lower. The composite total at 62, so would take it to 65 and a half. So plenty of room on the Nationals. Also like them to finish with the worst record in baseball if you could get 10 to 1 or better. Okay, very good. Couple more from that episode. DeBundo likes under Marlins wins, 78 and a half. And Charlie, De, uh, Charlie Disturco is on Trey Turner over 27 and a half. Stolen bases. So there you go. You can go find all of our division previews here on Payoff Pitch. Uh, succinct breakdowns from all of our guests. The analysts that I had mentioned that gave out picks, they're on those shows. So it kind of gets the gets the feeling back of the baseball season. And they do a deep dive on win totals and team outlook and all that good stuff. So head over there if you want more analysis on each of our uh, division previews as well as each team in said division. A quick heads up to the great state of North Carolina officially launched sports betting last week. So if you're in the Tar Heel state, take advantage of the best signup offers across every sports book. You can find a link to every one of those offers in the description of this episode, all the North Carolina offers all in one place. Just check out the link in the episode description. So as we mentioned at the top, we will be diving into the Korea series in Seoul, South Korea, Dodgers, Padres, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, the pitching matchups are out. I just had them up a second ago. Uh, Glasnow on the mound for the Dodgers on Wednesday against Yu Darvish. That's Wednesday at 6 a.m. Eastern. And then Musgrove, Yamamoto, the pitching matchup, Padres at Dodgers. So they'll flip-flop home field advantage in these two games. So last ups for the Padres in game one. Dodgers get last, uh, last at-bats in game two. Uh, we'll just go right in order of game one, game two. Unless you guys want to, Zarella, want an opening thought on just anything ballpark related weather or bullpen usage. Cause it is, op it is technically opening day for these teams, but then they're going to play spring training games after these two games. Yeah. We can talk about the park coach Chuck sky dome. So this park should play about four to 6% higher than your average major league run environment. It is the minimum for dimensions in terms of befitting a major league park, 325 to the corners, 400 feet to dead center. That is the minimum dimensions you're allowed to have if you're building a new park in 2024. But these dimensions should increase home runs, should increase doubles, and should reduce singles because there's just less room in the outfield for balls to fall in. Should be more balls caught by the outfielders. They probably get to play a little bit shallower too, which leads to the increase in doubles. And the park, leaning more towards offense, leaning more towards extra base hits, certainly helps the Dodgers stylistically. This team finished second in slugging percentage last season. They were second in home runs, fifth in doubles. The Padres were 15th in team slugging percentage last season, about 16th in doubles, 13th in homers. But the Dodgers have a stronger lineup than they had last season. They added Otani, they added Teoscar Hernandez, and the mm. Padres traded away Juan Soto. So teams moving in opposite directions. I just think the park and the way that it sets up for extra base hits benefits the Dodgers lineup. So... Uh, BJ will get into the specifics of the game and, you know, the, the lineups. But to me, I, I just think the, the park provides a little bit of a boost to the Dodgers chances. And I could see some home runs flying out of here. I, I guess my, uh, my dirty prediction is that Shohei Otani is going to hit a home run in one of these two games, getting about plus 250 on him. 
in game one, I think you could just go ahead and poke that for fun in both games and have a good chance of coming out ahead. I, I just have a gut feeling that Otani's popping one in one of these two games against a couple of right-handed starters. Oh, I, I thought you you were, for a second. I thought you were going to say that it's plus two fifty for him just to homer once in the in the two games total. That would be beautiful. But no, yeah. no. I mean, hey, you know, you, you get home runs in separate games. You cash both tickets, so you get a shot to cash both. But uh, yeah, I, I, just the gut feeling. Something I'll probably end up putting in the app just for fun. Uh, Otani did home run in one of these two games. I feel like it's going to happen. Should have mentioned the uh, <clears throat> the total. The eight and a half is the total for both mm-hmm. games. Uh, eight and a half. Yeah, and uh, eight and a half juice over probably about right for me with the park factor increase about four, you know, if this was in a uh, major league neutral park, I'd have these totals closer to 8.5, but in the sky dome, it's closer to 8.9 for me in both games. So eight and a half minus 120, probably about right. Books don't want to put up the nine. They've been very hesitant to put up the nine because they know they'll probably get sharp action on the under. So I'd imagine it'll be, it'll stay in close at about eight and a half minus 120. Okay. Hang tight. We'll get to picks, but BJ, just your general outlook of this event in Korea and how you, Assess both teams, how they fit to the just the game environment. Yeah, I mean, you know, Sean obviously from uh, the COVID days has you know experience in betting the KBO and all of these stadiums and everything like that. So I lean on his expertise as far as the stadium is concerned. But it's a very interesting you know dilemma here where we don't have to worry about bullpen usage, you know, day from the day before and everything like that. Everybody's full strength, everybody's ready to go. The Dodgers obviously have a better lineup than they did last year. Um, so it'll be it'll be an interesting game. It'll be fun. Um, I'm just debating of whether I want to wake up at five in the morning, uh, to watch these games or if I want to catch, see what, see what happens in the sixth inning. Um, but we'll see, but yeah, no, it should be a very fun series, but yeah, as far as the totals are concerned, like Sean said, they're, they're about right. I mean, I have 8.9 and game one and 9.2 in game two. So I'm not I'm looking to bet those overs, but we'll obviously get into some best bets here for, you know, money line and everything else. Pretty okay. sure it opened eight and a half minus 110 or minus maybe yeah. minus 115. It's definitely taken money and juiced up towards the over, but the offshore markets, I think it's always worth noting, especially with games like this, Island games, where we're going to have a ton of action. They've been very hesitant to move past minus 118, minus 115 on the over eight and a half. So it seems to me like the books are very hesitant to put up that nine and let the sharp betters bet the under nine. I think, I think they're very comfortable leaving this at eight and a half. So just to, just to kind of bring the, are we going to get like, just to bring the point home, are we going to get like Mexico City or London kind of numbers in these games, possibly? Run, like, no, run, I don't think run, so. Run, this run is a runs. much more standard Major League Park. Mexico City is way above elevation. I mean, True. you know, uh, six to 8,000 feet above elevation, it's way up there. So that's playing almost like a Colorado and at smaller dimensions as well. And in London, one, they were playing indoors. It was extremely hot, uh, you know, which increased the flight of the ball. But also they weren't using a standardized major league park. The, the walls were extremely shallow. So no, I think those are special circumstances. I think this, we have much more of a comfortable data point from professional baseball league, where we can see how this plays relative to the other parks in those leagues. And we've seen those players come over to the United States and move to the MPB. So we know how their talent compares relative to one another. So no, if anything, you know, I'm always concerned in games like this, that MLB is just going to send over a, a batch of juiced up baseballs because they want people watching, um, you know, it's a lot easier to wake up at 6 a.m. and watch a game that you know is going to be 10-9 than it is to wake up for a one nothing shutout at 6 in the morning. So uh, that's that's just my you know my conspiracy theory is the, the juice balls being sent to these island games. We've talked about it in the past, the Apple TV games. You know, there, there's circumstances where it seems beneficial for MLB to maybe juice up the scoring a little bit. But uh, the dimensions of the park, the park itself, this is this is very comfortably like a normal major league park. It's just a bit small to the corners and to center field. BJ, I'll ask you quickly as a consumer, if the score is 13-12, are you more inclined? If you know that's going to be the score, are you going to get up early? Does that, does that appease you? Yes, I will say this, though. Um, as a parent, it depends how the night goes before, whether right. I decide if I want to wake up. Fair enough. And every 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 parent listening to this episode knows exactly where I'm coming from. Yeah. See, this is what we do on Payoff Pitch. We also connect with our audience on a more personal yes. level. Um, like if it goes terribly, no, no, I'm not going to wake up. If it goes great, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> six a.m. first pitch, just about six a.m. for both of these games. So let's dive. Let's dive right into it. Glasnow, Darvish, game one. Dodgers the favorite, minus one ninety, what minus one ninety five total. Is Zerillo hit on eight and a half? Choose to the over. 
any and again, it's early in the year when we have a big slate of games. These guys will give out picks when we do our Monday, Tuesday, Friday shindig throughout the course of the year. They're, they're not betting every single game. Zarillo, any particular side or total that you'd like to give here for Wednesday morning? Dodgers in the first five innings. I see a bigger difference between Tyra Glass now and you Darvish than I see between these two bullpens. Now, depending on what measurement you use, you could either put Starvish and Glasnow closer together or they do get further apart. So by projections, expected fit projections for 2024, Darvish's range anywhere between 4 and 4.4. Tyler Glasnow anywhere between 3.4 and 3.7. So about 0.6 to 0.7 better in terms of the range projection. You go back to last season, their expected ERA was about a half a run apart. Their expected FIP was about a run and a quarter apart. So where are they relative to one another? Is the differential a half a run? Is it three quarters of a run? Is it more than a full run? To me, and when you break them down by pitch modeling metrics and stuff plus and location plus and pitching plus expected ERA, I make the differential closer to a full run. Whereas between the two bullpens, the differential for me is closer to half a run, six tenths of a run. So a bigger difference in the starting pitching matchup than in the bullpens, which is why I'm betting the Dodgers in the first five innings, not the full game. I make their first five projection closer to minus 200. I make the full game projection closer to minus 180. So much more in line with the betting market over the full game, getting a shorter price over the first five innings and give them a greater chance of winning in the first five innings just because of the differential in the starting pitchers. Now, as I mentioned, the Dodgers lineup better than it was last year. The Padres lineup likely weaker than it was last year. And on top of that, Padres is also dealing with Manny Machado, needing the DH, one of their best defensive players, having a DH because of an elbow, off-season elbow surgery that he's still recovering from. Not only is that going to put 20-year-old Jackson Merrill in their lineup, who played 45 games at AA, 20 games at AA, but Graham Pauly, who's played the opposite 45 or 20 games at double A, forgot combined. They have 66 combined games at double A, though, and have not played above that. They're both going to be in their opening day lineup. So these guys are making their major league debuts in Korea. Looking into the bullpens, too, the Dodgers have the better bullpen. There's seven relievers in this game who project for a fifth this season under four. Five of them are in the Dodgers bullpen. And one of them on the Potters, Yuki Matsui, has not made his major league debut. So. We'll see a couple of farm relievers likely make their debuts over the next couple of days from the Padres bullpen, one from the MVP, one from the KBO. We'll see the first matchup in a major league game between Otani and Darvish. Really looking forward to those matchups. I'm sure there will be a lot of media eyeballs and a lot of pictures being taken when those two Samurai Japan teammates face off. But, you know, it's... Uh, and yeah, I mentioned the differential in slug and, and how this part kind of favors the Dodgers as well. I should also mention too, six of their nine batters are left-handed. They're going to be a big problem when they face right handed pitching this season just because of all the lefty depth that they have. And Darvish does show worse splits against lefties than he does against righties. So fairly typical splits for Darvish. The Padres more right-handed heavy. Glasnow has fairly neutral splits for his career. Actually, in more recent seasons, has tended to perform better against lefties and righties, which I think is interesting. Final note on Glasnow, I expect him to change his pitching usage slightly this season. He's been throwing a slider about a third of the time in recent years, and it's really the worst among his main three offerings, fastball, slider, curveball. He's been throwing it more than his curveball, working on a sinker with the Dodgers in spring. The Dodgers love adding sinkers, two seamers, to the mixes of their pitchers, and sinkers and sliders tend to complement one another. So, would imagine Glasnow going to start dialing back that slider usage slightly, throwing more sinkers and throwing the slider and the sinker back to back and sequencing them more frequently. So curious to see if Glasnow throws that sinker a bunch in the first game of the season, but definitely like the Dodgers for the first five innings to about minus 192. And then the total of the full game side are both a pass for me. We'll talk about game two in a minute, but this might be the only pre or pre game bet for me over the next couple of days. Glasnow uh, strikeout prop at six and a half. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. It's, you know, I don't expect these starters to really go more than five innings. And yeah. even that is going to be if they're comfortable, right? They don't want to push them. They've still got 10 days till the actual season starts. And they only had about, I think, three starts each, three turns each 
and about nine innings total. So yeah, I don't expect more than five innings for either starter. Six and a half, probably about right. I really didn't really dabble into the strikeout or uh, you know outs recorded props or anything for these games. It's just okay. tough because we are still kind of in the midst of spring. I'm stunned though. You also mentioned that Darvish and uh, Otani have never faced each other. Yeah, never never recorded a bat in a game. Huh. I don't know if they faced one another in spring, but hasn't happened in a regular season game. Huh, okay. All right, BJ, what do you think for uh, game one? Dar- Darvish against Glasnow, Dodgers the favorite in both uh, first five full game and, the, and that total at eight and a half. Any particular side or total you're on? I am actually with Sean. I like the Dodgers for the first five innings at minus 170. Projected this closer to about minus 210. So I am having a pretty significant edge here on the Dodgers for the first five innings. Um, you know, Glasnow is a very interesting case because last season he started 21 games. And that was the most games he started in a season in his career. And we just kind of forget how much he's been injured. But along Sean's point of him adding a sinker, I think it's kind of interesting because last year, you know, if you look at his you know strikeout rate, walk rate, and home run rate, it's all been pretty consistent from year to year. But he increased his ground ball rate up to around 50%. Last time he's been over 50% on a ground ball rate was, you know, four years ago, or excuse me, in 2019. And that season, you know, he only pitched 60 innings, but he had a 1.78 ERA. So if he's adding a sinker, and like Sean said, he needs to throw his curveball a lot more than he does to slider because his curveball last season struck out 73 of his 162 batters and only threw it 24% of the time. So adding those two pitches and getting to be more of a ground ball pitcher, along with all still having a good fastball and still having an okay slider, could propel Glass now to really becoming the potential pitcher that we all consider him to be. So in this game specifically, though, if you look at the Padres lineup last year. Over the second half of last season, they were top 10 and weighted on base average. Well, if you dig into why they were top 10, their top two guys and weighted on base average were Juan Soto and Gary Sanchez, who are no longer with the team. So like Sean said, the Pirate Padres lineup is going to be considerably weaker. Now as for Darvish, like his stuff plus and his ERA and expected metrics were, were fine last year, kind of in line with a slightly above average major league starting pitcher. But I think we have to remember that you Darvish is now 37, which when I saw that, I got kind of like shocked for a second because he's been around forever. We just kind of forget how long he's been around and his effectiveness on a lot of these pitches because, you know, he can throw eight different pitches. So he can really mix things up here against the Dodgers. But quite frankly, it doesn't really matter what pitch you throw the Dodgers because somebody's going to be able to hit it at some point um, because of how good this lineup is. So I'm with Sean. I like the Dodgers for the first five innings at minus 170. Do you think Glasnow projects as a, as a pretty significantly better pitcher right now than you Darvish does? Dodgers line up much, much better than the Padres. So um, yep. I'm with Sean. Yeah, Darvish, not only 37 years old, but also shut down in August last year. Yeah. Elbow inflammation. So coming back off an elbow injury, definitely a concerning sign for 2024. And there's a chance that he just starts giving up a barrage of home runs this season. When guys are dealing with arm issues, the home runs tend to increase. So definitely a chance that he just gets firebombed in this small park. And that's why I'm considering taking some Dodgers to hit home runs in their home run props for this year's. And I'm glad you brought up, well, not glad because I feel bad for the player, but I, you brought up the elbow. Machado's coming off the elbow surgery too. And you guys are right. You look at this lineup. Bogarts, yeah, that contract looks a little dicey now. Moving to second base. Tatis, Cronenworth, Machado. Then you go to Kim. And then it, it gets pretty thin after that. So I know Machado's going to DH. He's not a pitcher. I understand that. He's a he, he, Probably fine if you can DH throughout the course of the year, but that, that's something they got to keep an eye on too. So it does get really thin after Soto. Yeah, they have like five good hitters, two good relievers, a couple of good starters where the Dodgers are deep at every, you know, at every level. So yeah. it's just the overwhelming amount of depth that they can throw at them down the lineup in the bullpen. Obviously, it doesn't mean as much for one game as it does over the course of a season, but they're just so much deeper in terms of their star talent. Yeah, uh, like, yeah, yeah. The Padres being banged up on top of it too, right? Machado still not 100% healthy. Darvish, maybe not 100%. So definitely that to factor in as well. Dodgers coming in seemingly fully healthy for the season. Yeah, like if we did the Padres in like the American League Central season preview, we'd be like, oh, okay, they got some pieces here. They might be all right. But when you you put them up against the Dodgers and they've got to play them more than, uh, they're going to play them more than any other team in the American League or National League. And then they're, of course, their division rivals it, it puts things in perspective um and you throw a couple of kids who are 22 years old and haven't played above double oh. a like in the back of the lineup it's just it gets even more drastic you know if they were 
playing guys like Brandon Drury and, you know, uh, Harrison Bader in those spots, you would think a little bit differently of it. But because these are complete no names, it almost makes the the ceiling even lower. It obviously raises the the potential uh, outcomes. But yeah, it's, I mean, Merrill projects for like a 90 WRC plus this season. Pauly actually projects as close to a league average hitter, which surprised me. Uh, of the two, I probably prefer Merrill as a prospect. But, you know, even even Merrill, I wanted to check out like his minor league fielding because he's playing a position that he was not drafted to play. This is a kid who's expected to play shortstop at some point in the future. And throughout his minor league career, he's mostly played shortstop. Uh, he has five games in the outfield. I see five games in outfield, five games in left field. I'm assuming that's five starts in center field last season, but it's very limited. I mean, he's played uh, close to 200 minor league games and 196 of them have, or 180 of them have been at shortstop. So not only making a big jump to the majors, but also playing a position he's not really familiar with. It's the Padres are aggressive. We talk about Preller all the time and his aggression, but this is particularly aggressive. Yeah. Kim had a good spring. Merrill, as you hit on, had a good spring. You know, he's hitting in the nine hole, possibly. Uh, we don't have the lineup yet. We have the pitching matchups. That's about it. And Bogart's had a bad spring. So uh, let's wrap with uh, game two. Uh, I don't think BJ's got anything for game two. Um, nothing he sees. We'll get his opinion in a second. But Zerlo, uh, with game two, uh, Yamamoto making his debut with the Dodgers. And uh, he'll take on Musgrove. What do you think for this one? Totals at eight and a half, and the Dodgers are favored. Yeah, I'm curious to see where Yamamoto's strikeout total opens because I think he's a guy I've mentioned is going to be hyper efficient, but also the first time he sees these lineups, I think he's going to be very difficult to hit. They're going to have to adjust to his tempo, to the movement of his pitches. I mean, the Dodgers hitters look like fools in their own spring training with him, just taking simulated at bats against him. So. What he's going to do to teams the first time he faces them, I think, could be astounding. Maybe he falls off in the second half. You know, his team see him a couple times. But in terms of the game two projection, I don't see a bet or I don't see value on either side or total. Need to see where that first five line opens. But I don't project a big difference between the first five and full game lines. In fact, the difference between Yamamoto and Musgrove for me is very similar to the difference in these two bullpens. About a half a run, six tenths of a run. So I make the Dodgers minus 165 with the first five innings, minus 160 for the full game in game two. I made the totals very similar, around 4.6 and 4.9 or 8.9 respectively. Uh, can get closer to nine with that total. So if the total dropped to eight and a half minus 110, I'd probably consider betting the over, but nine at minus 120 where it is currently. And then I'd probably want minus 155 or better to bet their first five line. I doubt we get it. If anything, I think the price is more juiced up with Yamamoto against Musgrove. Musgrove also coming off of some injury issues of his own and getting shelled a little bit in spring training yep. too. So definitely worth keeping an eye on as well. Uh, you know, just in my heart, right? I, I want to view Yamamoto as a significantly better pitcher than Musgrove. I want to view him as like a run and a half better. The projections say that's not a case. They say it's closer to about six tenths of a run, which again is the difference I have between these two full bends. So first five full games should be pretty similarly priced. Uh, BJ, curious where you have game two projected. Game two, I have the Dodgers at minus 145 in the first five at minus 154, total 9.2 and 4.7 ish, I would say. You're getting closer to playing the Padres at that price point. I am actually kind of closer, and I think that uh, my projection may be just. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, I think projection models are having a little bit of difficulty with Yamamoto. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, there's the range of outcomes is obviously very drastic here. Um, and, you know, as far as Musgrove is concerned, I mean, he's he's obviously been injured quite a bit throughout his career. Um, but when he's pitched, he's been pretty decent. I mean, last year he was 3.1 expected ERA, uh, you know, strikeout, walk rate, all that stuff is pretty consistent from year to year. So he's not a, you know, a terrible pitcher by, by any stretch of the means. But, you know, Sean, we actually do have an opener for the first five right now. Mm. And it's the Dodgers minus 165 over four and a half minus 115. So pretty much, like you said, going to yeah. be right in that type of range. So, I am, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I'm closer to betting the Padres. But I mean, I'm going to need like, you know, plus 155, plus 160, somewhere in, in that type of range to, to potentially bet them. And we're not even close to that yet. So. Um, this is going to be a pretty, uh, pretty easy pass for me. We'll probably just end up sleeping in. However, <laughs> and it's worth noting, you know, because it happened in Mexico city, it's happening in London. 
if game one ends one nothing or two one, or if game end one ends thirteen eleven, you're gonna see movement on that total yeah. from game two just because of the results of game one. There's always overreaction when there's a particularly high score or a particularly low score in one of these foreign games and there's a game the next day. So worth keeping an eye on. My total isn't gonna change. I mean, we we have a very solid park factor on this park, aside from MLB introducing juice baseballs, which if you see a billion home runs tomorrow. I think is a pretty safe assumption. But beyond that, uh, my projection really isn't going to move. So wait for a potential overcorrection after the mm -hmm. game one results with regards to the game two total. Curious if that was the case in 2018. Dodgers Padres played in Mexico, game one of that series. Walker Bueller combined no hit. He spearheaded a combined no hitter for the Dodgers. And then the Padres won the next two games. So. Now, again, different ballpark, and maybe the, the lineups are different now, of course. The Dodgers might be – they were still probably pretty good in 2018. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, well, they didn't have bets yet, so maybe they weren't that good yet. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. And speaking hmm. of bets, going to be trying to play shortstop. You know, I'm, that's like the biggest question mark by the Dodgers right now is their defensive alignment. Freddie Freeman was the second Padres too. What's that? Pa the Padres, too. Oh, so. 100%. <laughs> I mean, the Padres – you know, it's a complete mystery what they're going to be defensively. Uh, yeah, I like Kim, uh, but beyond that, it's it's a little sketchy, and they don't have nearly as good of a defensive outfield as they used to have. Grisham no longer there, so Padre is sketchy defensively, but the, the Dodgers have three good defensive outfielders, should all be above average across the outfield. But Freeman was the second worst defensive first baseman last year, minus nine defensive runs saved, not how you typically think of Freddie Freeman. Max Muncy is a bowl average defender at third base. Mookie Betts was a plus defender at second base, but now he's going to play shortstop where he was a scratch defender last year. And you have Gavin Lux coming off of a gruesome knee injury, which was so bad they needed to move him from shortstop back to second base. So the Stouders infield has the potential to have four below average defenders. Um, and that does lend itself to Yamamoto having, you know, a one whip, but like a 3.80 array. Like it's, there's a chance some more balls and player are going to leak through when he has runners in scoring position. And, that's just a little bit of a concern with the Dodgers team. It's the one area where they're clearly like average at best and uh, definitely do not have major upside to improve significantly given the, the construct of their roster. So curious if they go out and trade for Willie Adamas at some point or if they get like a real shortstop in there and move Mookie back to second base. But their, their defensive infield for now could be a real problem. And they might just overcome it because they're that loaded. So. Yes. Yeah. All right. Seoul, South Korea. The Korea series goes down on Wednesday and Thursday. We will find out if BJ decides to sleep in for one or both games. Follow like me on Twitter and I'll let you know if I yeah. if I uh, well, wake up or not. I, I kind of get it with Thursday because that is the first day of the uh, you know the March Madness stuff going on. The first real day you sink your teeth into it. Well, you know, as as somebody who also does uh, you know soccer here, there's some Asian World Cup qualifiers going on at you know five in the morning, so. Who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll be up for those if I feel like it. I just enjoy Here's both of us having the first five bet on the Dodgers and BJ specifically saying he's going to wake up for the sixth inning. So that's that's just like beautiful to me. Yeah. Well, I haven't. I'm going through these Asian Cup qualifiers today, so we'll we'll see if there's a game I actually want to bet and wake up for. Probably not, but okay, we'll see. All right, if you made it this far into the podcast, we know you enjoy betting baseball, so make sure you join the Action Network Discord. It's the perfect place to find live betting from many of Action's experts. BJ's there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe not at 5 a.m. Eastern. Maybe, though. Maybe, maybe, though. So if you're up early, maybe BJ will join you for a cup of coffee and a few handicaps. Uh, <laughs> Sean Kerner's strikeout props were, uh, <laughs> were all in there last year, and... Uh, Sean will pop in from time to time. I always, I always forget sometimes Sean Carter does baseball stuff too. So uh, you can be part of it. Just follow the link in the episode description to sign up to join along the Action Network Discord. That is going to do it for this episode of Payoff Pitch presented by BetMGM. We worked in the season preview best bets, the division previews, and we actually did some discussion on an actual game or two. So it was good. Uh, can't wait for the end of next week when we dive into opening day, real opening day, even though this is opening day for the Dodgers and the Padres. Uh, be sure uh, to follow the action, all the guys in the Action Network app, Zarillo, BJ, all of our baseball guys. And uh, you can track your own picks as well if you're in North Carolina, excited to do some Major League Baseball betting. Make sure you check out the link in the episode description for all of the offers. And please rate, review, and subscribe. 
For Sean Zarello and BJ Cunningham, Brendan Glasheen, thanks for tuning in to Payoff Pitch, Action Network's MLB betting podcast. We will talk to you next time. See ya. 